The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Vinnie Politan, and welcome to the Court TV Podcast. This week, we have another audio edition of the Court TV original true crime series, Someone They Knew, with Tamron Hall. Penny Skaggs believed in being a dutiful Christian wife, even teaching local women how to improve their marriages. Her husband, Roger Skaggs, would come home to find a scene that served a stark contrast to their seemingly idyllic life. Penny, brutally murdered next to her beloved yellow piano. Was this a robbery gone horribly wrong, or was something in the Skaggs' home out of tune? Featuring interviews with Travis County Judge John Wisser, Assistant District Attorney Brian Case, and forensic psychiatrist Leonard Weiss, this is Someone They Knew with Tamron Hall, The Perfect Wife. This is the Court TV Podcast. Penny was the type of woman who wanted the perfect marriage. He looks for his wife, doesn't see her anywhere, and then comes into the family room and sees Penny on the ground in a pool of blood by her piano. The police are thinking it's a robbery because there's some jewelry missing. There's a bunch of jewelry in, in the bathtub, and some things are kind of awry and jumbled. It was a killing and an obliteration of somebody. Penny and Roger Skaggs were pillars of the community in Austin, Texas. Roger was a very successful and respected businessman, and Penny was a devoted wife and mother. Both were leaders in their local church, and Penny even counseled women on how to improve their marriages. So it was a shock to everyone when on March 6, 1996, their picture-perfect life together suddenly came to a violent and tragic end. Roger Skaggs were a very all-American family, religious couple, and they lived in Austin, Texas in the 80s and 90s. They met in college, and then he was in the Air Force for 10 years. Penny was the type of woman who wanted the perfect marriage. She wanted a godly marriage. She wanted a godly man, and she was just dead set on being the perfect wife. They lived in a very upscale part of Austin in a really expensive house, which was kind of like their dream house. A lot of their social activities were centered around the church. I think both of them were very involved almost on a daily basis with some church activity. Penny also hosted a Christian course called Creative Counterpart at her home, where she would kind of counsel these younger women on traditional views and values of marriage. And Roger, he would host a Sunday school class with his wife, as well as a Bible study. Good Christian family. Penny wanted to honor Roger. She loved him. She loved him deeply. Penny was very devoted and dedicated to Roger as, as he was to her. She would do anything to please Roger because she felt that was her role and she truly loved that man. Roger is a pillar of the business community and he kind of bought into this company called APS. It was kind of like a startup we would call it nowadays. He was with the Ross Perot company and had already made a lot of money and apparently he made even more money with this APS place with stock options and all that. In March 6th of 1996 was a regular day. Roger had gotten up and had gone to work. Penny stayed home. Roger would be preparing to have a massive board of directors meeting the next day. 
So he's gonna be working overtime, and so he talks to Penny on the phone, and she says, hey, you know what, why don't you come home for a little bit, have some dinner, relax for a second, and then you can go back, finish up whatever you need for the next day. This is basically the way they did things. Roger would come home for an early dinner, and generally about 5.30. Then after that, he left 6.37, went back to his office. As soon as he gets home from the office around a little before 9, he walks in through the garage. He looks for his wife, doesn't see her anywhere, and then comes into the family room and sees Penny on the ground in a pool of blood by her piano. At some point, she was playing the piano, which she often did, and uh, someone came up from behind and struck her several times in the head, and then subsequent to that, stabbed her several times. In the wake of seeing his wife bloody on the floor, Roger grabs the phone and actually calls his neighbor, Diana Coleman. He said something about having looked for Penny and that he had found her lying in a pool of blood. And she says, well, get off the phone, call the police, I'll be right over. And so he calls Austin Police Department. I recall uh, something about an individual finding a body inside a residence and the subject wasn't breathing and there was blood around the body. The police are thinking it's a robbery because there's some jewelry missing. There's a bunch of jewelry in, in the bathtub and some things are kind of awry and jumbled. And then upon entering the master bedroom on the floor, you could see like somebody had taken the drawers out of a jewelry box and thrown them on the, on the floor. This was a neighborhood that I don't think there's ever been a murder in that neighborhood either prior to or afterwards, all very expensive homes, all executives and professionals. There was a sense of terror initially. Uh, people wanting to lock doors and, and being terribly afraid, and it was just a, uh, almost a revulsion to some kind of evil. On the night of March 6, 1996, Austin businessman Roger Skaggs came home from work to find Penny, his wife of over 30 years, brutally murdered in their suburban home. The attack was so vicious that she was almost unrecognizable. Evidence at the scene suggested that Penny had been the victim of an apparent home invasion robbery gone wrong. Penny Skaggs did have uh, a number of injuries. He attacked her by coming up behind her. He had a lead pipe. First blow, we believe, was right across the right side of her face. She had seven blunt force injuries to her skull, uh, head, and, and face. Then he uh, used a knife. He cut her throat with the knife. He stabbed her through and through uh, twice with the knife. It was a most shocking kind of attack with such vengeance. And I've been a prosecutor in a long time. I've seen some really bad stuff. But it was a killing and an obliteration of somebody. The investigation into Roger and Penny Skaggs initially started with interrogating Roger himself. What, what happened this evening? So I came home from work for dinner at 5.30 or 6 o'clock or so. Brought him down to the police station. Sergeant Detective David Carter was the one who uh, interrogated him. I, I called her and, and said, I'm not going to be able to finish. It's going to take me a couple more hours. She said, why don't you come home? Let's have dinner and you relax a little bit and you go back and finish. And so I said, OK. According to him, they had dinner, and then he stayed a little bit and then went back to the office. He definitely acted according to his normal behavior. He's coming home for dinner. He's going back up to the office. He went up there and just went right back to work. When you left the office, did you just go straight home? Mm -hmm. His alibi at the time of the murder was that he was at the office. He had some digital record of it showing on his hard drive that he had printed some documents, things like that, as well as Vanessa Ferguson, a fellow associate. 
would corroborate his alibi of him being at the office as well. Roger's at the office. He's working overtime. He says Vanessa is there working. So later that evening, he goes home, and he finds Penny brutally murdered. Look, I'm sitting right in my hand. Uh, I can see her head. So I kind of pat and of course, ran in there. And then came to a immediate stop because it was not even. That's really horrible. I mean, she just laying in blood, and her face was all bloated and bruised, and blood running out of her ear or what run it was there, and, and you know her head was in blood. Originally, he he is not a suspect, but for some reason, the police think that Roger now is suspicious. And what I need to understand is the relationship between you and your wife. Uh, in just a couple of weeks, we will have been married 35 years. And, you know, we've done everything together all our life, both active in the church, and we've had a wonderful relationship. Roger didn't exactly act how you would expect a grieving husband to do. Instead of buying two plots at the funeral home, one for Penny and one for him, as when he passed away, he only bought one. And kind of implying, I don't want to be buried next to my wife of 35 years. He also didn't want to attend her burial initially. When Roger got there, he had this flamboyant red, white, and blue leather jacket with an eagle on the back of it. At the very least, you could say that's inappropriate, right? But it, it's just like, I'm a free bird now. He's free. And he told a person who said, well, you know, you shouldn't make any big decisions the first year after you lose a spouse. And he went, well, I could be married two or three times in a year. <laughs> just making a joke out of it. Within days, literally, of her death, he's telling people that he might get remarried. He shined his lights, and they went over and panned the area, and he saw that there were two dumpsters down there. And near the bottom, there was a trash bag that was not like the other trash bags. In the wake of Penny Skaggs tragic death, Roger, her husband of over 30 years, displayed very unusual behavior. He seemingly shows little emotion when it comes to the loss of his wife, but he does have an alibi for the night of the murder. As detectives continue to search for clues, they make a dramatic discovery that will change the course of their investigation. It seemed to be a very happy marriage. Uh, we did things with them as a couple and uh, visited their home uh, quite often. And, and uh, they were always very loving and, and concerned with each other. He was just our normal brother-in-law as far as we were concerned. There was nothing that was out of the ordinary or necessarily extraordinary about him. He was just a member of their family. In some ways, that, that very rigid religious atmosphere, it kind of worked because she wanted to be the housewife per excellence and he wanted to be the big deal businessman guy. But the problem is when you get into that kind of structure, it's very difficult to adhere to everything in the structure. And unfortunately, part of the structure was supposed to be they're not going to have extramarital affairs. Well, Vanessa Ferguson was at one time, I believe, an employee of Roger Skaggs, and later they commenced to have an affair, and she was very integral to the case. She was a secretary at his office, and they had developed an affair, been going, you know, surreptitiously for a long time. We rationalized all of her behavior, and it never occurred to us that there was anything going on like there was. In December uh, of 1995, um, we were well convinced that there was something drastically wrong. I think that a lot of people will ask, why don't these guys get a divorce? First, Penny would never tolerate such a thing. It was totally against all of her 
religious beliefs. She wanted to honor him, respect him. She wanted to hold him up to the community because divorce was against everything she believed in. Roger, it would destroy his career because he had such a stellar oh, reputation with his, his clients. She was very tense yes. and she was very, uh, in Roger's presence. In Roger's presence, she was very unhappy. And we knew she was not happy. In the murder of Penny Skaggs, there were no other potential suspects. Our theory of the case was that Roger went to the garage, got the utensils, the lead pipe, the knives. He just came back in really slowly and didn't make any sound until he got right up to her. The guy was enraged. You know, he's repressing his feelings, repressing his feelings, repressing his feelings, repressing his feelings. And I think he is getting further and further away from her to the point where she is just an object out there. She is basically um, of no use to me. She's the thing that's stopping me from really being myself. In line with his desire to kind of present this as a burglary, he took her jewelry off and then he went into the bathroom where the costume jewelry was and wanted to make it look like a burglary. And so he just emptied all the costume jewelry in the tub. Looks like without even going through it. He changes his clothes into something a little more comfortable and then heads back to the office around 7, 7.15. And he claims that the only other person that was there happened to be the person he's having sex with. The investigation into Roger and Penny Skaggs really was quick. It was about a week-long investigation, and they sort of backtracked if he had done it, where would he go, what is in close proximity to the home, which was his office, and they were able to track down evidence from there. The chief detective thought that he was a logical person to have done it, and if he did it, when they noticed that things had been taken from the house, they would have been discarded somewhere between the home and his office, which was not terribly far from there. David Carter, who was a homicide detective, brilliant, brilliant move. And this was like at 3 o'clock in the morning. He went to Roger Skagg's house, and then he wanted to see how far it was to get to his office and trying to nail down the timeline. As he pulled around there, he shined his lights, and they went over and panned the area, and he saw that there were two dumpsters down there and that they had a lot of stuff in them. So he was going, well, you know, it doesn't seem like someone would put something in a dumpster on their own property, right? But for him to do things right, those dumpsters needed to be impounded. And they decided to examine the contents of the dumpsters, so they took them to a warehouse and they emptied the dumpsters on the ground and they were pretty filled with debris. And near the bottom, there was a trash bag that was not like the other trash bags. And he lifted it up far enough, shined a light in there, and he could see the pipe that was the instrument that was used to bludgeon Penny to death. And he could also see knives. Eventually, they uncovered the jewelry that had been taken from the house as well as a pair of rubber gloves. They turned them inside out, and inside one of the gloves, they were able to recover a fingerprint that they matched Roger Skaggs' fingerprints. Roger Skaggs, the upstanding businessman and devout Christian, was charged with the brutal murder of his wife, Penny. During their investigation, detectives discovered that Roger had been leading a double life. He was having an affair with a co-worker, attending swingers' parties, and wanted to rid himself of Penny so that he could avoid a costly divorce. I never saw any, any evidence of problems in their marriage. They were always uh, with each other and uh, always very supportive of each other. We, we believe that uh, he is innocent and uh, uh, are here to you know, basically show our love and support for him, really. 
On March 6th of 1996, Penny Skaggs was bludgeoned to death with a pipe cut with a knife in her West Austin home. The district attorney signed their two top trial lawyers to this case. So you're aware going in that you have a lot of high-powered lawyers with large egos and the stakes are extremely high. Penny Skaggs, the evidence will show, taught hundreds of women on how to be a Christian wife and mother. On March the 6th, when EMS, police, were called to this residence, they went in, they found Penny Skaggs with her legs tucked up underneath the piano, which she loved so much to play. They found her head and body in a pool of blood. The blood that had given her life such energy and vibrancy, the evidence will show, was now splashed across her beloved piano. So Roger's defense attorneys really didn't have a huge leg to stand on. They tried to pull some forensic evidence, some fingerprints stating, well, none of these matched Roger, Penny, or other friends and family, so it had to be this stranger intrusion, home invasion. Let's talk about this affair for a little bit. I know that there are eight of you that are not going to think that this is very funny when I say it, but let me say it in the worst way that I possibly can, ladies. Lots and lots of men have sexual relations with other women besides their wives, and the marriage doesn't appear to be the worst for it. The love for their wives does not change that much. It does not have any bearing whatsoever as they see it on their relationship. All of this is the imagination of, of Mr. Case. Not really. It is him hoping that you will draw on your imagination for something like that. To start saying that he is going to kill his wife to avoid getting a divorce. Because if he got a divorce, he would lose customers and that would ruin his business. When there is not one scintilla of evidence that there was ever any thought of divorce or any thought of any problems in that marriage is going so far that somebody is stretching an incredible amount. On the night of the crime, when the police were over there, um, he was being consoled, I guess you would say, on one of the neighbor's sofas, and he just never seemed like anything tragic or even out of the ordinary had happened. He was very calm about the and controlled about everything. Um, his answers were very deliberate when he was asked any specific questions. He would look over and he would see that I was watching him and he would suddenly look down at his laugh and, and start to cry. The way he would just turn on and off, it was like he had realized he was supposed to be upset. The police took him down to homicide detail and David Carter interviewed him. Sergeant Ravellis told me that uh, um, Penny Skaggs was found dead in her house and that by her husband, Roger Skaggs, and that he would be coming to the police department and they wanted me to interview him and take a statement from him. His affect was flat. He made some mistakes in the way he misanswered a couple of questions. Mr. Skaggs, I know it's, it's difficult for me to force you to think in these terms, but I'd like you to try and tell me what you think happened. I decided to employ a technique in which was to ask him what he thought had happened. When you ask a person who has just discovered something traumatic, what do you think happened? The usual response is, I don't know. This was, in my opinion, perhaps the best investigation I've ever seen conducted by the Austin Police Department. I mean, it's conceivable somebody could have come to the door and she told her to go away and then went around to the back or it could have been, you know, somebody just wandering down the street. He speculated there's these people that would occasionally come to the area, transients or like magazine salesmen. Mr. Skaggs indicated that Penny wore lot. At first he said lots of jewelry. He changed that and indicated that she wore some jewelry, but it was expensive and it was not good. I guess uh, the jewelry contained large diamonds. 
she wears a lot of, not a lot, but, well, she wears some pretty big diamond jewelry. She has a nice big wedding ring, a big center stone, and stones all around it, and a couple of necklaces with a lot of diamonds. And, you know, that could have, I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out. Mr. Skagg speculated that one of these transients came to the front door. Penny told him to go away. At that point, that person was able to go around to the back of the house in this area that was very dark. Mr. Skaggs then indicated that Penny was most likely playing the piano. Mr. Skaggs said that Penny was real focused and sitting there, and then he corrected himself, would have been sitting there. And then, you know, she was real focused and sitting there, and her back is kind of to that area, it would be to that area when she does that, and that's the only thing. That and in my experience, when a person starts going down this direction and places themselves in the first person, it's possible they are reliving an event. I have never seen Roger even raise his voice. He's probably one of the most non-confrontational people I've ever known. Do you believe that he would be capable of carrying out such an act as the murder of his wife or the murder of anyone? No, I can't imagine that. After the murder of Penny Skaggs, investigators quickly focused on her husband, Roger, because of a surprising lack of emotion he showed at the loss of his wife. That suspicion motivated investigators to seize and search the dumpsters behind his office building. And it's there where they made the case-breaking discovery that led to Roger being arrested and charged with Penny's murder. I think the prosecution's strategy was basically there was the motive. He had the girlfriend, and surely his wife would not approve. There was a convention, a uh, swingers convention in the ballroom of their hotel, and they went. And they, OK. Did he say that he and Vanessa Ferguson attended the swingers convention? Yes. The most damning evidence that the district attorney presented was evidence of Roger Skaggs and Vanessa in Las Vegas engaged in various activities. Describe how you met him, please. Uh, I did his nails. And when was this? Uh, in October 4th of 96. And did he have anybody else with him? Yes, sir. Who? Uh, Vanessa Ferguson. Roger Skaggs had been in a relationship with Vanessa. And I think a lot of people at the office suspected it for a long time. Curiosity got the best of us. And uh, we had heard rumors for nearly a year of uh, that he was having an affair with someone. And we decided, let's see where he's going. OK. And so we followed him. And was there any kind of greeting between Roger and Vanessa? Uh, yes, he hugged her and kissed her. I said to Roger, well, Roger, um, I need to understand about this affair that, uh, that you have told me about. And uh, what, what is it all about? And it, it struck me so profoundly how he described it that I wrote the two words down. He called it animal lust you know somebody who has just animal lust towards someone and they're married to a woman who is i guess you could say prudish you can kind of start seeing how someone who likes animal lust would enjoy this secretary of his what is it that roger did not provide penny with that you believe that Penny wanted him to do. And I apologize to America, but I want to find out. What is it? An attentive and loving husband. OK. More showing of, of attention uh, than, than Roger did. Is that correct? Not more. Some attention. Penny was getting wise to what was going on. And that had a lot to do with why the murder happened when it did. Soon after the murder, I mean almost immediately, 
Vanessa disappeared, and we tried to find her. She was given to us as a main chief defense witness, but she disappeared, and I issued subpoenas and eventually arrest warrants for her, but she was never able to be located. From knowing Roger Skaggs for this period of time, uh, in your opinion, does he have any propensity at all for violence? None. Well, the defense strategy was the normal strategy. It certainly wasn't Roger. He was a good, decent person. Yes, he was having a relationship with this Vanessa Ferguson, but in no way was he capable or would he have ever done such a gruesome act as this. And in knowing uh, Roger Skaggs for this period of time, have you formed an opinion as to whether he has any propensity for violence at all? I have never seen Roger even raise his voice, much less be violent. I had an opportunity to observe Roger in many, many different situations, including being under pressure. And uh, he's probably one of the most non-confrontational people I've ever known. Oh, that's uh, right. Very laid back. This is a murder trial, as I think you know. And Roger's on trial uh, for the murder of his wife, Penny. <clears throat> I don't want to go into any of the evidence with you. I just want to ask you one question about this. From everything that you know about Roger Skaggs, do you believe that he would be capable of carrying out such an act as the murder of his wife or the murder of anyone? No, I can't imagine that. I mean, he'd be the last one that I would ever think would be capable of doing something like that. Pass witness. I wanted to understand how both of these people thought, and I had to felt like I had to understand it in the context of their daily lives and in the context of their church. Well, actually, I, I went over there, first of all, just to, to be a comfort to Roger and find out what happened. Uh, I think by that time I knew that Penny had been killed. I found the pastor, went to his uh, service two times just to try to understand what makes this church tick from my experience um, all people who love someone dearly want to talk and talk and talk about this person but i did think it rather strange that he did not want to you know just talk about penny and you know things about her he just really wanted to just go on and plan the funeral I said, well, you know, Roger, what they say, um, you shouldn't make any important decisions for the first year. Okay. And he said, oh, no, you know me better than that. I'm not going to wait any year. I'm not going to what? I'm not going to wait any year to make any important decisions. And he laughed and he said, by that time, I could be married two or three times over. After the murder and and then after Roger was released they kind of reinstated Roger and at one point he came in and he made a, a joke about Penny's murder and I said Roger how how can you joke about this and I will never forget these words as long as I live he said if you don't see the humor of it it will drive you crazy and I said, how can you see the humor? There's no humor here. I'll never forget that as long as I live. He didn't even act kind of sorry that Penny was gone. It was, the, what he did say was he sort of missed the things that she did, like he had problems either finding the checkbook or writing checks or that kind of thing. But, and there was no, wasn't any anger about, you know, trying to find somebody who did this to her or anything like that. It was just, it's just real unemotional. Does today hold any special significance to you, Ms. Goldman? Yes, it does. What is it? It's Penny's birthday. She would have been 57. 57? Today. They said it's pretty clear, clear cut. The story is old as time. Husband meets another woman and needs to get out of his marriage. And she wasn't the type of woman who would give him a divorce readily. So he resorted to this.
The jury in the Roger Skaggs murder trial have learned a lot about him and his extramarital activities. While a key witness refused to testify, the state has provided powerful physical evidence that is impossible to explain away. The only question is, will it be enough to convict Roger Skaggs? Penny had no enemies. There was no reason for anyone to have killed her, except that they needed her to be dead. And Roger was the only one in, the, in, in any recognition that we had that could possibly benefit from her death. And it just made sense. Haven't you seen in the last three weeks more denial and hypocrisy that you've ever seen in your whole life? The denial of Penny Skaggs, the hypocrisy of Roger Skaggs. I had to be able to explain it to the jury. If they couldn't understand what was going on in these two people's makeup, then they would never be able to understand just the sheer material evidence. The defense wants to talk to you about a madman or somebody driven to such extreme rage. Uh -uh. Whatever he is, he may be ridiculous. He's not a madman and he's cool, calm and collected. All the better to do a crime like this. Tell you what, Penny Skaggs was a homemaker all her life. She didn't work. How much of his fortune do you think she would have gotten upon divorce? Wouldn't have been just 50%. Let's talk 70 and 80. That's what she would have gotten. That's a lot of money that he can't use either on Vanessa Ferguson or whoever else. The way he behaved, very calculating, very non-emotional. The police just, from the very beginning, they knew, they said, something's just not right here. Cool, calm, and collected. All the better to plan this out, to have the gall to go do it, and then tell everybody the stories he did, and then have the gall to tell these sisters over here that he's going to be remarried and move out of Austin and tell Penny's best friend he doesn't want to go to the burial. Oh, he's got a flair for the extravagant, all right. He's got a flair for the extravagant. And this murder was extravagant. The state has decided that because they do not have, or at least I believe they have decided, that because they do not have sufficient evidence to be able to establish that Roger went home and for some reason, out of nowhere, murdered his wife in the most brutal way that you can imagine, and you've seen now, that they're going to have to make a demon out of Roger Skaggs. And that's what, as Randy said, they have spent 90% of their time doing, is making a demon out of him. The evidence has shown no such thing. All of those words, all of those suggestions have come from right here, not from right there. We have had a few dear friends of Penny's who have wanted to get up there and speculate as to what Penny was thinking. We had uh, this very capable lawyer, Brian Case, telling you earlier that Roger had made up his mind that he was going to have to kill his wife because if he divorced his wife, he wouldn't get as many clients anymore and he would have to give her 70 to 80% of all the property that they have. Brian Case is the only person who has ever used the word divorce in this case. And he is already telling you that there was a divorce on board and it was gonna cost him 70 or 80% of his home and his stock and whatever money he had on hand and his cars, his entire estate. I do not believe that you people and sit down in the quiet of your room and think over all of this evidence. Put yourselves in Penny's position, put yourselves in Roger's position, and come to any thought that at 5.30 in the afternoon when he left that office, he was going home to murder his wife. That is crazy.
The members of the jury would please retire to commence your deliberations. Thank you. I'm always concerned, but I wasn't that concerned because I had 12 people. And I figured, you know, they could have had me do it, but fortunately they elected to have 12 jurors. The 12 jurors were very attentive. They listened to the evidence. No one was nodding off. No one was sleeping or anything like that. So I had confidence that they did the right thing. Speaking to your foreperson, have you arrived at a verdict in this case? Yes, we have, Your Honor. If you would, sir, please stand and read your verdict. We tried the case just like we wanted to. We fully expected um, a, a guilty. They were out eight and a half, half hours. We, the jury, find a defendant, Roger Thomas Skaggs, guilty of the offense of murder as alleged in the indictment. I think that the verdict wasn't a surprise simply because of the evidence. I think that the simplest answer was going to be Roger. He had motive, and his timeline didn't work out. His alibi didn't match up. Despite him being a wealthy white man, luck was not on his side. I am not satisfied that this man killed Penny Skaggs, and that is the truth as I stand here. I am not satisfied of that. I've thought about it as much as anybody. And uh, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that he came home at his wife's request, ate supper, and carried that out before he went back and worked another couple hours. That never has made sense to me. We are uh, pleased with the verdict. We felt like justice and truth would be honored here, and they were today. Sense of relief, but it's not over. We have another phase of this trial, and uh, we're preparing ourselves for that. After deliberating, the jurors came back and unanimously found Roger Skaggs guilty. And then we proceeded to have the second portion of the trial where the juries determined the punishment to be assessed, Mr. Skaggs. In addition, the juries recommend the defendant receive a sentence of 32 years confinement in the institutional division and a fine of $10,000. The sentence was 32 years. I mean, we asked for a life sentence, right? And uh, we were, at first, quite shocked that he only got 32 years. But uh, my recollection is that 32 years was the length of their marriage or the length of time that Roger and Penny had known each other. I have tried quite a few murder cases, and that's the only 32-year verdict I've ever seen. I think that people are still talking about this case because it is relatable. People in marriages, you know, can struggle with a spouse. There's definitely a level of narcissism that comes with these offenders and the sort of entitlement and elitist attitude thinking that no one can touch me, the law can't touch me, I covered my tracks. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's not always the case. And Clearly, you're not the smartest guy in the room. I think we've increasingly seen the hypocrisy of a considerable number of religious leaders in, in this country. The mere fact that you're a minister of a large flock in no way guarantees that you're an outstanding human being or a person who follows in God's footsteps. Roger Skaggs is currently serving out his sentence in the Turrell unit of the Texas Department of Corrections. Although he's been eligible, parole has been denied. He remains behind bars and is due to be released in the year 2030. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew. There you have it. Another episode of the Court TV original production, Someone They Knew with Tamron Hall. If you'd like to see this episode and more, check the show notes for a link. And to keep up with the biggest current legal stories, be sure to tune into my show, Closing Arguments, weeknights at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for downloading. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.